Camas is a flower in the lily family. It's a perennial species. Camas can be light blue, it can be purple, it can be darker blue, it can be different heights too. Um, it's all dependent, uh, scientists think, on the pH of the soil. The bulb of camas is sort of like an onion. It's got these layers um, and it's edible. So it was a pretty important food uh, root crop for the Nez Perce and for other Native Americans around here. We are at the Weite Prairie. It's the site of Nez Perce National Historical Park. And it's significant because the Nez Perce were here and they harvested traditionally camas out in these fields. And what's even more important for um, the history of the United States is that Lewis and Clark, when they came out of the Bitterroot Mountains, they met the Nez Perce out here. So they were starving and the Nez Perce were harvesting camas bulbs and they met on the Weite Prairie. This is the point of contact between two cultures, between the, the native peoples of the interior Columbia Plateau and the Lewis and Clark expedition. That makes this area very nationally, historically significant. That's why it's included in the National Park Service and especially in Nez Perce National Historical Park. Well, the reason the people were here, the reason the Nez Perce were here was because of the camas. Nowadays, uh, the camas density is much, much less than it used to be. The reason we're monitoring, the reason that we're paying as much attention to it as we are is because it's a focal resource for this site. It, it, it not only is it uh, important as a natural resource, as an indicator of a healthy wetland, it's also historically important um, as a reason why the Nez Perce were here. And so to us, to the National Park Service, maintaining this habitat and, and, and in some instances possibly restoring this habitat to allow for the camas to flourish again is, is right in, in line with what the National Park Service does. In helping people understand the importance of the Nez Perce use of camas, it's good to know something about their tools. And so uh, the women were the traditional food gatherers of plants, and they would have used something called a tukas or digging stick, uh, originally with made from wood and a wood handle or bone. Of course, you have to have something to hold that, just like we nowadays have bags of all kinds to collect things and take things where we want to go. They would have a bag to, to collect their camas, but it would have been much larger. It would have been handmade from materials that they'd gathered. And the Nez Perce are known for having two different sides to their bags, two different um, designs. And then of course there's, there's camas itself. And this camas has been cooked in the traditional way, which is an earthen oven. They would start a fire on the bottom with hot cooking rocks. Um, when it went out, they'd fill the pit with camas, cover it with leaves and grass, and start another fire on top. And it could take up to three days to cook a pit of camas. They would um, then dry it because camas is so much natural oils, it needed to be cooked before they could dry it. And then sometimes crumbling it or, or preserving it whole. Nowadays, maybe just canning it in a jar, like we can other things. And camas has a real smoky taste, kind of sweet, because the sugars are concentrated, but it's also high in protein, and it's very nutritious. Citizen science is science that's done with students or volunteers or local people and so they come and help real scientists and ecologists um, do their work in the field. And so we have three different high schools in the area uh, around Weite Prairie who are helping us, uh, the students are helping us monitor camas populations. Our, our park staff go to the high schools and provide education in the classroom so that when the students get to the site they know what campus is, they know how we're doing the monitoring and they understand why we're doing it. And if you have any questions you will have your staff member in your group. They use a compass, they um, maneuver to a certain compass bearing that has been predetermined on their data sheet and then they set down their quadrat and then count the campus plants within that.
57 and 11. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great opportunity for park staff because we get to work with, with young, young people. Uh, they're usually very enthusiastic. They, you know, it can rain, it can be hot, and they might complain a little, but they're right out there doing the job. This is, this more, is more fun. fun. Definitely. This is a lot of fun. Way better. I think it's good for the students as well because they have an opportunity to see what a resource professional does in the field, how we gather information and how that information can be used then to make management decisions over the long term for the site. The mission of the National Park Service is to preserve the resources for the enjoyment of future generations. One of the best ways we can do that is to involve the future generations in the management of the resource. And so I, I think at a site like this where we're, we're a small park, we're in small community, we have a small site, we can come out and do this, this kind of intensive monitoring project with only a couple days worth of effort. But it can make a lasting impression in these, in these young people that if we're going to manage resources and use them wisely in the future, we have to understand what their value is. It's our job as the Park Service to preserve this resource so that others can understand how that plays into their future and the, the past as well.